Sense of History, a podcast that connects history to current events. Today's going to be a great episode where we talk about China, the Soviet Union, and the United States from an international perspective. So last week, we talked about the Great Leap Forward, the Sino-Soviet split, and we kind of left with this at the 7,000 Cadres Conference where you now have this multipolar uh, international situation. And in that situation, the United States doesn't really, I don't think, fully realizes how the level of rift that has occurred between the Soviet Union and the Chinese, that's really going to set up what we're going to talk about today. There's going to be quite a few conflicts that define U.S., Soviet, and Chinese relations for the, ne- for the coming decades. So starting at the Sino-Indian War, moving through the Chinese, developing a nuclear warhead, getting involved in Vietnam, and then the Russians and the Chinese almost going to war in 68, 69, and that over a border dispute. So these events are really going to define the international situation and events. Then we're gonna it's gonna set up into the domestic and internal look at what's going on in the Chinese and the culture revolution. But we're gonna get to that later. So Jay, for today's episode, can you go over some of the key takeaways that we're gonna talk about? Yeah, for sure. And thanks, Con, for that intro. Like you said, our last episode we we really focused in on the Great Leap Forward and what was going on with China. In this episode, we're gonna see that China was essentially just pissing everybody off, <laughs> Inter- internationally speaking. Mao Zedong's policy was rigorously nationalistic, and he viewed China as not just not just able to become a world leader, but its rightful place is the world leader, and everyone else just needs to fall in line. That was kind of his his view. Uh, and we'll see that. There was continuing issues and conflict throughout the 1960s. We're, we're going to focus on the 60s in this episode uh, with the United States. But then also there was growing conflict between China and the Soviet Union, which normally in our history textbooks, at least here in the United States, the the issues with China and the Soviet Union from an American perspective are largely couched in terms of the rapprochement that occurred during the Nixon administration in the 70s. But what we want to draw out here in this episode is let's let's remove that American filter from those issues and let's look at the Sino-Soviet conflict kind of independent of the Nixon administration narrative and see what the and what the issues were and honestly it's fascinating because in our last episode we talked about the Sino-Soviet split from a purely ideological standpoint you know we talked about uh, the communist concept of revisionism about the dictatorship of the proletariat and how Mao saw not the workers class but the peasant class as the as the cadre of world revolution and how that differed from the Soviet Union, um, but in this one we're going to see like there's actually some you know long standing historical beef between the Chinese and the Soviets, mainly over Manchuria, and we'll we'll get in we'll get into that here here in a little bit. So first, our our first key takeaway is between China and the US and Vietnam. So we know that the US in the early 60s started getting involved in in Vietnam during the Kennedy administration. Uh, So the first key takeaway is even though China sent military aid to North Vietnam, the CCP did not want to fight another Korean war against the United States. So they largely stayed out of Vietnam, kind of in the same way that NATO and the United States don't want to fight Russia and Ukraine right now. We're just sending arms, but we're not. We don't have any uh, any military forces in contact with uh, with Russia currently. And China was had like a similar policy for Vietnam. They were content to to arm Ho Chi Minh and the communist North Vietnamese uh, instead of actually, you know, sending the hordes over like they did in Korea. Secondly, in 1964, this is our second key takeaway. In 1964, the PRC successfully tested a nuclear weapon. And in 1967, they tested a thermonuclear weapon. And what that did was that that shook the United States and the Soviet Union to our core. 
the United States prior to that point, if if you guys recall in earlier episodes, our policy to try to keep China in its box was nuclear brinkmanship. We would threaten to <laughs> just you remember the Joint Chiefs of Staff nuke them. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, what are we gonna do? Let's nuke them. Okay, guys, we can't can't send nukes. We can't nuke mainland China as a first go. Yes, we can. Let's nuke them. <laughs> that was that was Douglas MacArthur. That was later Curtis LeMay. But once China had their own nuke, the U.S. kind of started to think twice. Secondly, the Soviet Union also started to think twice about its policy in China. Key takeaway number three. In 1969, the PRC and the Soviet Union actually started having skirmishes in two different places, in Manchuria and in, uh, I'm not going to pronounce this right, the Xin, Xinjiang, Xinjiang province, west of Mongolia. It's the, it's the western border on China with them in Russia. Uh, there were these border skirmishes that couple hundred people on both sides were killed and it almost led to like full blown war between China and the Soviet Union which led China to think to itself we're about to go to war with the Soviet Union they're actually on our border maybe we need to be nicer with the United States and then lastly this is and this key takeaway is more of a segue to our next episode but there were quite a few domestic considerations within China and the United States at this time. And those domestic issues, so the Cultural Revolution in China led led Mao to go, wait a minute, maybe we're too isolated. Maybe we need to reconsider our foreign policy. And in the United States, there was, you know, the 60s was a wild time to be living here in the United States. And we needed peace. We retired from Vietnam. We, The Nixon administration wanted to win. And that were some driving factors to us being nice with the Chinese again. So Jay, that was covered a lot in the key takeaways there. So let's let's dive into them a little bit. Can you, where does this really start? You know, within the 60s, you know, doing yeah. some research on this episode, you know, one of the biggest, or one of the first events I would say would be like the Sino-Indian War. Yeah. Kind of the border war, and that's sort of where we start to see the the Soviets and the Chinese playing against each other in a lot of ways. Can you tell me a little bit about that conflict and the U.S. response to it? Yeah, for sure. And it's it's frustrating. We um, there's so much to talk about. <laughs> you could do a whole little mini series because it is kind of an interesting, like going through yeah. the history of it, reading through there. So India is a you know, we we the Americans talk about uh, how confusing China is. Like India is its own misunderstood and untamable uh, beast, and to this day, there are border skirmishes between India and China. India has a very good relationship with Russia, uh, and they've kind of had a okay relationship with the United States. There's an issue with Pakistan. So like at this time in the 1960s, both China and Pakistan hated India. So China and Pakistan were were tight uh, over India, but the United States wasn't that friendly with India because India was also friendly with Russia. <laughs> so it was like the United States couldn't necessarily play India off of China because India is friendly with Russia. And that actually remains the case to this day. Uh, India still buys significant military sales from Russia and the United States has, you know, we've sold the Pakistanis a long time ago F-16s, which is a major multi-role aircraft. And when the Pakistanis with American equipment are fighting the Indians with Russian equivalent or a Russian equipment, we start freaking out because it's like, Oh man, which one's going to win? Like this is going to impact our foreign military sales. <laughs> it, it, it's uh, yeah, exactly. It's like who who do I uh, who do we buy? Or do we buy Rostock and Raytheon here? Do we go with Lockheed? No, it, <laughs> it is interesting. Like they the Pakist the Pakistanis and the Indians. Just kind of a little background. Once the British basically decolonized India, they divided. They they made this artificial boundary between Pakistan and India, and they're like, okay. Muslims, you go to Pakistan. Hindus, Sikhs, everybody else, you guys go to India. See you guys later. It's obviously a lot more complicated than that, but it led to a lot of like Muslims and Hindus fighting each other. Um, well, it led to a war. 
They well, fought a war with one another. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. This is an anecdotal story, but a very good friend of mine, he is his parents immigrated to Canada before he immigrated to the US, but his he has stories of his like great grandfather and grandfather. They were Sikhs and mm-hmm. His family lived in Punjab and he tells stories of his great grandfather and grandfather literally having to defend the village at night because like other, like they would cross the Indus River and come down and attack the villages at night and try and take, just kill people, take people away. And he was like, it was, they tell stories about just like disappearing in the night and going off and fighting each other. So during this war and wow. even after, just kind of shows you like little, you know, during the fifties in the United States, we were worried about, you know, this far off threat. Meanwhile, in other parts of the world, there's just like, Hey, get the gun, go out. You know, somebody's attacking, you know, the far side of the village. We got to go chase them off. So yeah, tensions were high. The only reason I wanted to say that is it was sort of like they, they hate each other for a lot of reasons. The Pakistanis and the Indians, they fought a war. It's very tense. So, you know, just a little historical perspective behind that. And the British were also responsible for the, what was called the McMahon line, which separated China and India, which will come into play during the Indian, the uh, Sino Indian war. Yeah. So in 1962, the Indians and the Chinese fought a a low key war against one another. (laughs) And what it was, was, um, Mao, uh, Mao attacked India. So it was this unprovoked, uh, uh, you know, surprise attack against India and it completely caught India off guard. Well, in this moment of like chaos and panic in New Delhi, they, the prime minister sent a, actually sent two letters to Kennedy in the United States begging for military support, primarily aircraft. So the proposition was, hey, we need you guys to send your fighters over here to India and protect our airspace so the Chinese can't get air superiority over India. And the Indian Air Force will do offensive sorties against Tibet and China itself. He's like, so we just need you guys to play defense. And Kennedy's initial response was not like, yeah, but it was, we're open to it. And Kennedy's response in 1962 was, hey, we're going to send a delegation to see for ourselves the situation on the ground. So, which was wise. Kennedy had actually just successfully kind of staved off the Cuban Missile Crisis at this point, which is why this this conflict kind of gets forgotten from the American perspective in history. Is just the Cuban Missile Crisis was a lot more closer to home. <laughs> And but we we almost sent fighter jets into into India, uh, and then I think Mao kind of realized what was going on, and they just kind of stopped attacking, and with the Chinese withdrew to the border. But this the reason why we bring this up this the 1962 Sino Indian War, uh, where several thousand people died, by the way. Um, is this is this is one of the first examples in the in the 1960s where like Mao's aggressive foreign policy was driven by domestic considerations and it continued to isolate China from even its most obvious ally the Soviet Union because again the Soviet Union and India were friendly with one another yeah cuz if you remember this is around November of 1962 when this happened so we're at the host great leap forward 7000 cadres conference and a great way to divert internal or attention to internal problems is to create an external conflict which is kind of what they did like reading about this like the Chinese definitely pushed the limits on the Indians to see how how much they could get away with and how much territory they could grab because it was it was almost just like okay we're going to patrol the McMahon line okay now we're going to patrol the other side of the McMahon line and then the Indians were like well if you do that we're going to shoot you okay and they did it anyway and they started shooting each other and then the Indians basically the Indian army just collapsed within a matter of days it, it was so quickly. But to your point, yes, Mao, putting it in perspective of what was going on internally to China, Mao had basically staved off a bunch of internal dissent at the 7,000 Cadres conference. He, the Great Leap Forward failed utterly and was about to launch like a new, before the Cultural War, which is still a few years off, or Cultural Revolution, because that was still a few years off, was about to kind of um, reintroduce socialist education. So a lot was going on, but I think it, Part of it was to divert some of that attention to let's get some more territory on, on India. I think that was maybe kind of 
you know, not one of the official reasons why, but you have to think that that might've been it. And then they just, they just stopped. Like when it was, um, what I think it was the prime minister of India was like, said it was like a thief in the night piece came like a thief in the night, just all of a sudden out of nowhere. Boom. Okay. The Chinese said, all right, we're going to withdraw. Sorry. Yeah. No, yeah, I, I do like that phrase. Peace came like a thief in the middle of the night. The the Indians were shocked. Uh, but to your point, it's 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 highly likely that Mao was, you know, Mao wasn't exactly at his high point within domestic Chinese politics at this time. And when you're struggling domestically, it's always a common tactic of dictators to start external uh, conflict in order to get your critics to stop focusing on you and to start focusing on your external enemies. Erdogan, the president of Turkey, is doing this right now, by the way. He's got a major election and it's kind of up in the air if he's going to win. So what is he doing? Turkey is currently doing a lot of saber rattling against Greece right now, and which is weird because they're both part of NATO, but they're they're doing this bickering over islands and a demarcation line in the Aegean. Uh, But again, to the point, it's just dictators, when domestic issues arise, a common tactic is to cause problems externally. Uh, Also, before we move on, fun fact, the today, along the disputed territories between China and India, the the militaries on both sides, in order to prevent like a larger conflict from popping off, because these militaries just stare at each other, um, they at both the Chinese and the Indians military. They don't have weapons. They <laughs> both sides have agreed to like take away their weapons so that they don't shoot at one another. So what happens is these patrols. Usually the Chinese patrols will you know wander their way into the the mountains that where the Indians are at, and they'll just get in fistfights with one another. And a major issue broke out. This was a couple years ago, where. Like a massive, like hundreds strong Chinese patrol with no weapons uh, rolls up on an Indian patrol and they start beating the crap out of each other. Well, then they start grabbing like rocks and sticks and they end up killing people. So there were Indians and Chinese died due to blunt force trauma, (laughs) no weapons. And it caused like a major incident and, you know, India and China had to like back down and blah, blah, blah. But I just think it's so funny that. They like it's kind of like the we're gonna shell this random island in the in the Strait of Taiwan uh, on even number days. It's like, hey, we got to put up a a tough look, but we're not actually trying to be lethal here. <laughs> well, a couple weeks ago, I think it was a couple weeks ago. There's video that came out. They were patrolling, and literally on one side of this just small fence is the Chinese with a bunch of big sticks and like makeshift shields, and on the other side are the Indians with like makeshift shields and sticks and they're beating each other like it's this ancient battle. it looks like they're kind of larping like a greek battle from LARPing? ancient history. <laughs> it's live action role <clears throat> live action role play for you non-nerds out there listening so but mm. it is just funny looking at that because you're like what the hell are these people doing <laughs> you're just beating each other with sticks and but to your point it's always like a everyone looks at them as like oh what's gonna pop off here because the moment somebody brings a gun to a fist fight like mm-hmm. An international crisis could break out. Like suddenly, the Chinese might invade India again. Yeah, but yeah, interesting, interesting uh, situation. Bringing it, back we're not to, doing that with the Canadians, that's for sure. <laughs> bringing it back to the topic, so the Sino-Indian War ends very quickly, it takes everyone by surprise. Part of that was attributed to Kennedy's rapid, at least, response and showing that he was willing to to fight or get involved. And I think that sent right. shivers down the uh, the Chinese spine because they didn't want to get involved with the U.S. again. That was in 62. What else happened afterward? You know, there was the nuclear, the nuclear test in 1964. How did that change things? So, yeah. So, 1964, China gets the nuke, a nuclear bomb. And what, what we wanted to cover here was prior to this point in time, the U.S. policy to try to keep China in its box was to use nukes. Just to kind of go like we're you know threatened to nuke you. Well, of course, Mao and the CCP, like anybody would, they're like, well, we need nukes so that they can stop bullying us, and they got it. And guess what happened? We, the United States, stopped threatening to use nukes. The North Koreans today have figured this out, uh, and the Iranians today have figured this out, and the U.S. completely lost 
any credibility in terms of nuclear nonproliferation when we just threaten to nuke non uh, nuclear countries, uh, they're of course going to conclude, well, we need a nuke too. And in 1964, they got one. So that was kind of the end of US nuclear brinkmanship against China. Moving on to Vietnam. So American involvement in Vietnam is is somewhat of how to how to cook a frog. You you don't throw the frog in boiling water. You put the frog in lukewarm water and then turn up the heat, and all of a sudden it's boiled and dead. Uh, and you do, and it doesn't even realize that it's boiling. To, you know, cooking. The same thing happened to the United States in Vietnam. There was very much a slow. Okay, we've got it. You know, from the U.S. perspective, we have this policy of containment. The Kennedy administration, after Eisenhower, was still very much. Uh, adhering to the containment policy. And we saw Ho Chi Minh and the North Vietnamese. Just real briefly, after World War II, kind of similar to Korea, the US and Soviet Union agreed to divide Vietnam into a North and South part. And then they were supposed to have elections to reunify the country. Well, those elections never took place. Uh, this is after the Vietnam declared its independence from France. And and then once those elections never took play, then all of a sudden we started getting antsy about the communists in the north and we started, you know, sending advisors to the south, and that's when things started heating up. Well one interesting note about that is after World War II, when Ho Chi Minh you know the Japanese left, and Ho Chi Minh was going to come out and publicly declare that the the Japanese had been officially kicked out. They surrendered, and they were going to try and declare their independence. He actually quoted the Declaration of Independence and Thomas Jefferson and said, "We hold these truths to be self evident that all men are created equal." And then that was part of his speech. And he actually sent advisors and emissaries to the United States, pleading with them to back his cause. But it's interesting to note the U.S at the time, didn't really want to say, hey, France, we just fought a war for you, but uh, we're not going to back you in this. You need to give up all your territory. So like, obviously, looking back 80 years, we can armchair quarterback and be like, that was really dumb. But at the time, the US just didn't feel it was in the position to say, France, sorry, you just got steamrolled by the Germans and all this bad stuff happened, but now you've got to give up. <laughs> sorry, France. <laughs> <laughs> now you've got to give up your your the source of your rubber. That's why Michelin makes tires. There's no rubber in France, but they did get it from v French Indochina, which was Vietnam. So, yeah, <clears throat> that's my little sidebar to say that we made a lot of mistakes in this era for when it comes to foreign policy. This is just one of them. So, sorry. Many, Jay. many mistakes were made in the 60s. <laughs> lots, lots of mistakes. Um, so, as the US starts ramping up in its involvement in Vietnam, the Chinese Mao. They recognize, hey, we need to support our communist friends, but we are not trying to get into another Korean War with the United States. So even beginning in 1950, the CCP began sending like advisors to Vietnam. But really in the 60s, as you know, after the Gulf of Tonkin incident and the US really starts ramping up its troop numbers in Vietnam, uh, the Chinese really only sent military equipment. So from, what was it, from 1964 to uh, 1974, the PRC sent North Vietnam about 2 million guns, over a billion rounds of ammunition, and several hundred tanks and airplanes. It was a pretty significant military aid to North Vietnam, but they never really sent any any troops into into North Vietnam. As a matter of fact, it's probably the Russians sent more like pilots and military advisors to Vietnam than than China did. Which brings us to our next point here, and that is as Mao saw it was important to counter the US in Vietnam on his border, he saw that Vietnam was actually becoming really friendly with the Soviet Union. And after the Sino-Soviet split that we talked about in our last episode, Mao was afraid of Vietnam actually becoming an ally of the Soviet Union, which would create in the event of a Sino-Soviet war, 
it would it would present a two front war problem to China. So their military aid, uh, really, I think, starting in 1969, started dropping off. It didn't stop, but it definitely started dropping off. And Mao wanted to keep a lot of the military equipment to himself because he was afraid of fighting a war with the Soviet Union. Did you ever read that book? We were soldiers and once and young, like the movie We Were so Soldiers. I, I, yeah, I never read the book. Yeah, well, but the, the movie's movie, fantastic. The movie's fantastic. <laughs> Definitely, highly recommend. However, the book it talks a little bit more about the battle um, in depth that the movie doesn't cover. But I, I distinctly remember reading it when I was like 15 years old, and there was like one incident where this U.S. soldier gets he gets separated, and he ends up seeing like gets kind of lost and separated from the U S and he ends up like more or less tracking a bunch of North Vietnamese and in, in the air because he's in the vicinity of the battle. But he makes note of like seeing a soldier that was dressed very differently. Um, he looked differently. He, and he like per the Intel reports thought he was Chinese because what he was wearing. And so he made a big deal amongst the U S intelligence community because this was in 1965. So they kind of freaked out mm -hmm. thinking that the Chinese were sending like actual military advisors. It was yeah. never, they could never really like, other than this one guy saying like, Hey, I saw a soldier that was dressed differently. He acted differently. He wasn't carrying a weapon. He was just communicating with the North Vietnamese. Like you can't really base like, okay, we're going to make a ton of decisions off this other yeah. than it alerted yeah. <clears throat> the U S Intel committee that, okay, maybe the Chinese are a little bit more involved than we thought. And this is in 1965. Yeah. So right. I just thought that was interesting. Even I remember years later reading that book and how the point I'm trying to make is the U.S. was extremely worried that the Chinese were going to get involved and send actual soldiers into Vietnam to fight the U.S. because they were worried about getting into another Korea. Right. Yeah. It's uh, honestly, aside from the the Chinese sending a few advisors and military equipment. The Vietnam War really changed U.S. and Chinese relations that much because they were basically at rock bottom. And when there was no... So at this time, there was no diplomatic contact between the U.S. and, and China. As a matter of fact, there there's something called the PRC-U.S. ambassadorial talks where from like, I think it was 1954, so after the Korean War, to 1971, which is when Kissinger went to Beijing and Nixon went to Beijing in 72, I believe. Uh, the US ambassador to Poland and the Chinese ambassador to Poland had like several hundred meetings over this roughly, uh, I think it's a 15, 16, 17, I don't know, math's hard. A uh, time period, so there's like a there's like this nice built you know this mansion in Poland that these ambassadorial talks that was the only unofficial diplomatic contact that the U.S. and China had during this time. Uh, so relations were frozen. There was no in the in the UN, the Republic of China or Taiwan was the was the representative on the UN Security Council that wouldn't change until again rapprochement in the 70s so there was no contact so with that being said like Vietnam didn't really change US and Chinese relations that much because they were already pretty pretty bad and the only way they were going to get worse is war and the Chinese decided that that was not in their interests at this time so with that being said let's transition to the lead up to the 1969 Sino-Soviet border conflict. And real quick, some history on Manchuria. So I don't believe we covered too much on Russia's part in the unequal treaties. Uh, we kind of focused on, on the Qing dynasty and the Brits you know, they fought the first and second opium wars. The U.S. was trying to enforce its open door policy. But what we really didn't cover and what we'll kind of briefly touch on now is Russia had designs on Manchuria. You know, this is during the Industrial Revolution. Manchuria actually has significant coal and iron deposits, which is important for making steel. Uh, and Russia was like, hey, there's this nice, big, flat territory that's right along our massive border. We sure do like it. Uh, and long story short, the Russians, through uh, military intervention, 
took over and annexed what's what's called outer manchuria so if you're looking at a map of russia that on the far eastern side of russia there's like this odd like slice taken out of china um down towards japan and at the very bottom is a major russian port city called vladivostok Russia wanted once you get north of Vladivostok, it's basically ice year round. Vladivostok itself ices a lot, but there are times of the year when it's not ice. So Russia was building its Trans Siberian Railway, and it goes through Manchuria to Vladivostok. Once they had taken this over from the Chinese, well, that Manchuria has been part of China ever since the Qing Dynasty took over in the 1970s. So uh, prior to that time, it was the home of the Jurchen tribes uh, and the Jurchen tribes or the Manchus, they're the ones that invaded China. The Ming, yeah, the Ming dynasty took over, became the Qing dynasty in the 1700s. So fast forward to 1969 (laughs) and Mao wants his territory back (laughs) because it's China and there are resources there and China's trying to industrialize. And so there was these negotiations between the communist Chinese and the communist Soviet Union to try to get that territory back. Well, in the 60s was a time of rapidly deteriorating relations between China and the Soviet Union. and two, so two things happened that kind of led to uh, skirmishes between the Soviet Union and the Chinese. The first one we've we've already touched on, and that is China gets its nuclear bomb in 1964. But then they also tested a hydrogen bomb or a thermonuclear weapon in 1967, which has a significantly larger yield than uh, than a, a traditional nuclear bomb. And that scared the crap out of the Soviet Union. Yeah, that, they were, that, that program is called Two Bombs, One Satellite. So one, one bomb being a nuclear warhead, the second bomb being actually an intercontinental ballistic missile, ICBM, and then having a satellite being able to, you know, there's Sputnik, there's a space race with so the Chinese wanted to be involved. So they launched a satellite as well do anything, but it was just part of their space program. So they look back at this. It was like a really big deal as far as them gaining power, power parity with uh, the international community, specifically the Soviets in the United States. So it is kind of interesting. And there's even monuments and like they look back on that with a lot of pride and memorial. So it's pretty interesting. Little, little sidebar. Yeah. in in prior to the Chinese getting the bomb, from a military planning standpoint, the Soviet strategy was they were like, hey, we are scared to death of the People's Liberation Army just due to their numerical superiority. So Russia, a lot of people assume that Russia is super populated because it's just a massive country. And that's actually not the case. It is, it's only a country of like medium size. It has roughly half the population of the United States today. Uh, so their military struggles with manpower, honestly. For for it to be a, you know a top five military, which it's not, and uh, we've we've talked about this in other episodes. <laughs> and but during this time, they were scared to death of the PLA just because of their numbers. The PLA being the People's Liberation Army, the Chinese Army. Actually, their entire military is called the People's Liberation Army. Um, so they're like, Hey, if we ever get into a war with China, the only way that we're going to hold off the Chinese horde is through nukes. Well, when China got nukes in, in the sixties, they were like, Oh no. And the Russia actually considered doing preemptive strikes on their nuclear programs just to prevent China from getting a nuclear weapon. That's how, that's how bad things were between China and the Soviet Union. So that was the first thing that happened. The second thing was in 1968, the Soviet Union invades Czechoslovakia, another communist country. And, you know, this isn't a podcast series about the history of the Soviet Union, so we won't go too too far into that. But what we get out of the 1968 invasion of Czechoslovakia is the Brezhnev Doctrine, which the Brezhnev Doctrine states that the Soviet Union reserves the right to invade 
any other communist country, <laughs> which seems odd because they're communist. It seems odd, but who was he? Who who was he? May potentially talking to there, Jay? Who do you think he was talking to? So, as we were discussing before the before we started recording here, <laughs> was. It was probably intended for the United States, who was actively waging a war in Vietnam, another communist country. So from an American standpoint, our takeaway was, oh, shoot, maybe we shouldn't invade North Korea. Maybe we should just bomb them. Sorry, not North Korea, North Vietnam. Also North Uh, Korea. Definitely don't want to. (laughs) Also North Korea, yeah. And it was kind of seen as a shot towards the United States saying, hey, you know, if you guys fiddle around in our communist countries, we're going to, we reserve the right to send our military in. Well, from the Chinese perspective, the Chinese saw it aimed at them. And the Chinese saw, they're like, oh, shoot, they're trying to justify them attacking us. So Mao concluded in 1968, we have to attack them first. So he directed the People's Liberation Army to be to begin uh, attacking the Soviet Union. And what he was, what Mao was trying to do was not try to initiate a full blown war. I, I honestly just Jay's opinion here is when you're a dictator and you have this cult of personality, you believe in your own cult of personality, in a common like ego trait of of dictators is they feel the need to like show their strength. You have to, your strength, your entire legitimacy revolves around your ability to project power and maintain power. Right. So when I say he directed the PLA to attack the Soviet Union, it was probably not with this intention of like, we're going to start a nuclear war with, with Russia. Rather, it was like, we need to show them strength so that they don't attack us. And what that led to was the 1969 Sino-Soviet border conflict. There were two places that this conflict broke out. We, we talked about them in the beginning of the episode, and that was in Manchuria and, and in Xinjiang, uh, which is near where the Uyghurs uh, uh, are, are at now, um, which is a Muslim minority group that's heavily persecuted in China. There's actually, by some estimates, CCP is conducting a genocide right now against the Uyghurs. That's kind of where where Xinjiang is. And this this conflict goes from like March to September of 1969. And March is when the the Chinese and the Soviets kind of fight over this island in a river that separates Soviet Manchuria from Chinese Manchuria. And then in Xinjiang, it was just kind of like a much smaller border clashes, but roughly a hundred people on both sides were either wounded or killed. And it led to an escalating of tensions between the Soviet Union and China. This, this border conflict was only resolved through, interestingly enough, the death of Ho Chi Minh. Um, because the Chinese had withdrawn their ambassador from the Soviet Union, and they would not allow the the Soviet ambassador to, to maintain residence in Beijing, but they would let him come visit. So, at the there was a state funeral for Ho Chi Minh in September of 1969, uh, and it was at the state funeral that. Delegates from China and delegates from Russia were able to communicate with one another through third parties. So they never they never made a explicit meeting. And that led to the Soviet ambassador to China to fly to Beijing and they held talks at the Beijing airport. The the Chinese were still super pissed and they wouldn't even let the ambassador leave the airport. So they they held talks there there in the airport and they were able to agree to a ceasefire and a status quo antebellum, i.e. like everybody just chill the heck out. It was very similar to the 1962 Sino-Indian War, except less people died. This was the closest that China and Russia would come to open conflict. Both sides were preparing for for major war. Um, There was a lot of domestic considerations going on with the Cultural Revolution and we'll talk about the mobilization of the masses. Mao was now was intentionally trying to uh, 
to militarize his country and this and this kind of played into that but another side effect in in kind of getting back to US and Chinese relations here another side effect to this was Mao and the CCP learned hey war with the Soviet Union is a very real possibility we might have made a mistake by completely alienating ourselves from literally everyone maybe the best way forward for both Taiwanese reunification and if my number one enemy is the Soviets, who's their number one enemy? It's the United States. Uh, the enemy so, of my enemy is my friend. Right. So in a very like um, uniquely Chinese way of conducting uh, diplomacy where they will turn on a dime and offer the most like ambiguous explanation uh, they basically completely 180'd their U.S. policy. And that was instead of being like, hey, we have no diplomatic relations. So this was late 1969. Come 1970, overtures start being made between the U.S. and China. And that, you know, we won't get too far into it, but this rapprochement that we keep alluding to in these episodes between the between the US and China was very much driven in part by the 1969 Sino-Soviet border war and the Chinese realizing like, wait a minute, we can be friendly with the United States and that will help us get what we want against Russia. We'll talk about this when we start really getting into the internal politics of China next week. But one comment on this, I don't know if it was necessarily Mao that had this huge revelation. He might have started having it toward the end of his life where you know you start reflecting on your legacy things are like mentioned china's at a low point in like the late 60s they've they're in the middle of the cultural revolution millions died during the great leap forward they're at the brink of war with the soviets tensions are still kind of kind of high with india i think it was his successors that in the ccp that recognized that okay if we are going to survive as a party, as a country, we need to evolve. And that evolution is going to have to include the United States in some form or fashion. I think they also recognized very early, um, you know, with the Great Leap Forward, the failures, that they're going to need other funding for their industrialization if, if they're to counter the Soviets. So one of the points of the Great Leap Forward, now Mao obviously talked about, okay, we're going to pass the UK in 15 years. He also wanted to pass the Soviets. There's that rift that had formed. He wanted to pass the Soviets. They recognized that they couldn't do it all. And I think you mentioned it last week, but that investment had to come from somewhere else. So they allowed Kissinger to come and visit. And then that is what set up this economic relationship as a counterweight to the Soviets. Even though the Soviets may ideologically align with them more, um, you know, that's not going to do anything in a border war. You can still fight somebody. You know, there's the old saying like democracy, you know, two democracies rarely go to war with each other, or don't go to war with each other. It's not exactly true for communist countries. I, I don't know if that, that rule holds. So, um, you know, I think that's why that the successors, my whole point is to say is the successors of Mao were the ones that were really pushing this. Okay, Mao has this cult of personality. Once he's gone, we've got to redefine what it is that we're going to do moving forward if we're going to survive as a party, as a country um, with the rest of the world. <clears throat> yeah. It's honestly, I think like I think that's true in part in like yes, Mao's so Zhou Enlai, Ding Ding Xiaoping, um uh Cheng Zuming, Zumin, they they all recognize like, hey, it's in our interest to be to be friendlier with the United States. However, I also can't help but think like it's also true they're playing the United States. Like this this whole time they're playing the United States. And I mean like from from 1970 to 2023, they they view the United States as idiots and they see we are we are selfish money loving capitalists that will literally sell our soul to the devil if it gets us more money and throughout the 70s and the 80s and the 90s as china puts on this facade of oh we're we just want peaceful uh what's the phrase they use it's like peaceful 
is it peaceful evolution or like peaceful growth or something like that? Like they're like, oh, we want to be a responsible player on the world stage, like peaceful coexistence, blah, 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 blah. And I, it is crap. They they are perfectly content accepting Western money to modernize and industrialize their country while at the same time, they conduct intellectual theft. They nationalize businesses that were joint ventures between a Chinese private entity and a Western private entity. All of a sudden, this is... <laughs> They will, yeah, they'll nationalize the business. So all of a sudden, like, hey, all your all your resources belong to us now. They've done that multiple times. If you um, if you're not following what's going on in the economic situation, the CCP is 100 percent propping up the real estate market in China. So this is just an example. Evergrande was a company that they are not allowing to become insolvent, similar to what we did in 2008. But they've also had tanks lined up outside of banks to prevent a run on money. To, so. They're basically seizing people's assets in the banks. And this all happened within the past year or two. And to your point about the CCP, I did want to say this. Michael Michael Pillsbury wrote a book called The 100-Year Marathon. He's extremely hawkish in his approach to China, extremely. But I did see in an interview that he gave where, Jay, he, he kind of reiterated exactly what you said. So that's why I wanted to inject it because he believes that there was this um, not negligence, but this naivete on the United States part going into China. It was done not in good faith because the United States, and he even used the term, I think he even said that he was guilty of it being a what they called a panda hugger, where they were like super like, okay, we got to invest in China. These are going to, this is the next country that we've got to invest in. You know, we're going to create this great ally, this Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is a future trade agreement that comes out. But they invested heavily in this relationship with China under the illusion that it was going to be this equal type, you know, two powers investing in one another and the US can get cheap labor and we're going to invest in their infrastructure. And then the Chinese are going to ship us these goods and everything's going to be great and we're going to be at peace. But meanwhile, like you said, they were taking advantage of it completely and undercutting the US at any point, any chance that they could get. Um, right. It's also interesting now, like uh, everybody obviously has heard of fentanyl and the, the opioid crisis in the US, but like, Looking at it historically, opium was dealt during the opium wars in that era uh, by the via the like the British and some of the Western powers because it was an agent of destabilization. Like it got the Chinese hooked on it. One of the things the CCP did was like, "There's no more opium use. Like that's illegal because they knew it was so, so detrimental to the community." Well, where do you think fentanyl is coming from? It's it's made somewhere. It's synthetic. It's made in a lab. It's shipped to a country and then snuck across the border. That source is the Chinese. So it's like we know the Chinese are shipping drugs that can 100% kill and destabilize the population, and we're not really doing much to stop it. But that's my own little diatribe here, just to say that, yes, the Chinese are not acting, being good faith, acting in good faith and being good allies in this. And we are absolutely being taken advantage of. So I do agree with Michael Pillsbury in that, that point and you, Jay. Yeah. Thanks, Colin. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, my only, so generally speaking, I, I think my, Michael Pillsbury gets a lot right. However, I disagree that, and I really, not just him, but anybody there, I, I'm personally torn between whether or not conflict is inevitable with China, there was an article that came out this past week on uh, some Air Force guys saying, Air Force four star general saying, uh, war between the US and China is going to happen by 2025. And it's like, that's honestly ridiculous. Um, there's, there's no reason to believe that there will be war between the US and, and China in 2025. Uh, there's no like, there's, it's not like Russia and Ukraine. I think I talked about this in the next episode where Russia and Ukraine share a very long border. It's more like France and Great Britain during the Hundred Years' War. There is a there's a body of water, and we are talking about an island, and that is significantly more difficult to take over than, you know, a plane adjacent to your own country. And the Chinese know that. And frankly, their their navy is not strong enough at this point to enable that kind of operation and it's not going to be in anytime soon. So I say all that to say like the hundred year marathon kind of seems to imply that there's going to be like an imminent conflict. I 
There, there might be. I do think China's going to, you know, they're not going to stop until Taiwan is a part of their country again. Whether or not that looks like an imminent conflict, I'm not 100% certain. So. There yeah, I, I think it's going to happen. I just don't think it's going to happen within the next two political cycles. So there, there's still a lot that needs to happen to enable some kind of conflict. But wow, we went uh, we went from uh, there's a lot. <laughs> we, there's a lot going on. Yeah, let's uh, let's go bringing it back to some of the key takeaways. Jay, like where does this leave us? So the the Soviet Union and the Chinese have not gone to war. The United States still doesn't have. Until 1971, we still don't have, you know, our diplomatic relations are frozen. Where does this leave China moving forward? You know, we're kind of at the end of the 60s, if you will. Yeah. So nineteen the 1970s could be thought of like, hey, guys, the 60s were kind of crazy, huh? <laughs> can we like... Can we like make things better? <laughs> both like both in China and the US and in Europe. Uh, everyone's like, man, the 60s weren't that weren't that great of a time. Let's try to chill out for a decade or so. That'd be great. Um, and that's, you know, from the Chinese perspective, that's where we get the rapprochement and and kind of a, a cooling of relations between the US and China. Now, China then begins to pivot towards internal considerations and the cultural revolution is in full swing at this point. And we're, we're going to talk about that in our next episode. Jay, thanks for that. I mean, great episode. There's a lot going on that I think we need to consider, especially moving into next week's episode on the Cultural Revolution. For all our listeners out there, we appreciate your support and listening to us. If you like what you've heard so far on the Loins of History, give us a five-star rating. We'll give you a shout out next time that we do. We've gotten a couple four stars. Well, you know, we, we thought we might address some of the commentary sometime, but uh, we're really waiting for And If you give us a five-star rating and a review, we'll give you a shout out on the episode. You know, you can follow us on social media. We're on variations of the Lloyds of History, Twitter and Instagram, Facebook, and uh, even YouTube as well. So you can give us a listen and a follow there. Give us any feedback that you want. We're both accessible via social media. You can reach out to Jay and I, and um, we'll get back to you with any suggestions. Had a few people reach out asking about different, different uh, just random history questions, but it's always fun to interact with people social media so feel free to reach out anytime we'll get back to you as soon as we can and uh, if you have any suggestions or other feedback for the episodes topics you want us to talk about that would be great we're happy to listen to it and uh, try and incorporate it into our next couple episodes on the history of u.s and chinese relations so with that being said thank you for listening and uh, we look forward to uh, next week's episode thank you